Hello and welcome to, what is it? Knowledge 11, Lesson 7. This is Discovery and Danger on the Prairie. Now listen, the danger is some of the animals and uh, some of the people they met on the prairie. And I have a guest narrator who's going to read to you because he's been pestering me. Some of his friends are the people you're going to run into in this reading, okay? So, without further ado, we'll begin with our guest narrator. Hello, friends. It's Rattenborough. I have missed you. Well, I'm glad that Mr. Hoops is letting me do this because there are some friends of mine or maybe their great, 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 great grandchildren or grand deer or grand... Well, anyway, there I knew their... No, wait. Maybe I knew somebody. They look like people I know. I'm confused. Let me get to reading. On July 19th, 1804, William Clark found himself at the edge of an ocean. It was not the Pacific Ocean, the vast sea to the west that Clark and his friends had hoped to reach. In fact, it was not an ocean of water at all. It was a large, flat area of land covered in grass called a prairie. A prairie is called a grassland. I know a song that my mother used to sing. Oh, bury me not on the lone prairie, where the coyotes howl and the... Ice cream's free. I don't know what the rest of the song is, but a prairie goes on as far as the eye can see, just like the ocean. Well, Clark was out hunting for the expedition and spotted some elk tracks, which he followed up a hill. He later described what he found at the top. I came in suddenly to an open and boundless prairie. I could not see the edges in any direction. This was so sudden and entertaining that I forgot the elk that I had been following. Clark had reached the eastern edge of what today we call the Great Plains. Wild grass as high as Clark's knees stretched out and blew gently in the wind, interrupted every so often by a hill or a grove of trees. That sea of grass stretched all the way to the distant Rocky Mountains, which it would take the core of Discovery weeks to reach. And here's a picture of my friend Oscar. Okay, during these weeks, the explorers saw many plants and animals new to them. Meriwether Lewis was especially fascinated by the pronghorn antelope, called pronghorns for short. He tried to get close enough to draw pictures of them, but the pronghorns always ran away. Pronghorns have incredibly sharp eyesight and a strong sense of smell to warn them of approaching danger. When Lewis finally came close to a pronghorn and got a good look at the long curved horns that gave the animal its name, he wrote, The speed of this animal is equal, if not superior, to that of the finest racing horse. The pronghorn is my favorite of all the animals we have encountered so far. Oh, look, it's my old friend Peggy Sue. Well, the ex this is a prairie dog. The explorers were also astonished by a tiny prairie dog, which is a tiny rodent. Just like me, a rodent. These little creatures, related to squirrels, live together by the thousands in what men came to call prairie dog towns. The prairie dog towns consisted of underground tunnels that sometimes stretched out for miles across the flat plains. We have to catch one of these to send back to President Jefferson, William Clark declared. But catching a prairie dog was not so easy. One prairie dog, standing guard above its hole in the ground, saw the men coming and chirped a high-pitched warning. Instantly, all the creatures dived down into the ground. The men dug down after them but found that the tunnels went down more than six feet below the surface spreading out in all directions with emergency exits to escape the many predators, hawks, coyotes, and <laughs> snakes, all of whom considered prairie dogs to be delicious snacks. Clark wrote down their findings about the prairie dog and the pronghorn antelope in his journal. Still following the Missouri River across the prairie, the expedition moved on. Soon they began to meet new tribes of Native Americans. Most were friendly and welcoming especially one tribe called the Yankton Sioux. A few of the Yanktons guided, or led, the travelers for a few days, but then said, You are coming to the land of the Teton Sioux. We will not be able to guide you any longer. Ooh, Lewis and Clark had already heard about the Teton Sioux. President Jefferson wanted them to become friends with the Teton Sioux. However, the Teton Sioux were not interested in trade with the settlers and did not want to allow Lewis and Clark on their land. Uh-uh. One 
One September afternoon, John Coulter, one of the expedition's best hunters, was following the tracks of an animal. Coulter dismounted. That means he got off his horse to look more closely. Some Teton Sioux, hiding among the nearby trees on their own horses, shouted and rushed forward, running off with Coulter's horse. Coulter walked back to the river and reported to Lewis and Clark what had happened. Minutes later, five Teton Sioux appeared on the shore, calling out to talk to Lewis and Clark. Captain Clark answered, We will not speak with you until our horse is returned. Minutes later, more than 200 Teton warriors, all armed with bows and arrows, rode out from the trees and spread out along the riverbank. They wanted to protect their land. Captain Lewis remembered that President Jefferson wanted them to be friends with the Teton Sioux, so he quietly ordered, Stop the boats and hold them steady here in the middle of the river. Clark, smiling, called, We come as friends from our great chief. The chief that Clark was talking about was President Jefferson. We invite your chiefs to come and see our great boat. Clark ordered a few sailors to row him to shore in a pirogue, and after greeting the three main chiefs, Clark brought two of them aboard the keelboat. There he and Lewis were friendly to the Teton Sioux and gave them gifts. Then Clark and the oarsmen took the chiefs back to the shore. Meanwhile, Captain Lewis stood ready on the keelboat's bow and his soldiers kept rifles in their hands or right by their sides in case of trouble. Everything seemed to be going well until one chief shouted, Your gifts are not good enough. You may not return to your big boat until you give us better gifts. Sioux warriors grabbed the pirogue's rope and held it securely. Now look closely at this picture. Clark knew that the Teton Sioux honored courage, that they, they really respected people who acted bravely. If he showed any sign of weakness at this moment, the Tetons might attack. Even if there were no fight, any chance of a strong friendship with the Tetons could disappear. Clark whipped his sword out, holding it high, firmly demanded, Release our boat at once! Back on the keelboat, Lewis ordered his men, Prepare arms! Only on my order may you fire, and not a second before! Instantly, the soldiers raised their rifles. In answer, the Tetons raised their bows and arrows, ready to shoot at the core of discovery. No one moved. The silence stretched out for a long, tense moment. Then a Sioux chief told the warriors holding the rope, Let go. They obeyed. Clark told his oarsmen, Re Return to the keelboat. One of his men asked quietly, Without you, sir? I gave you an order. Clark said in a voice that sounded much calmer than he actually felt. As the pirogue pushed off from the riverbank, Teton warriors surrounded Clark. Lewis could see only his friend's hat over the shoulders of the Sioux. Lewis gave orders, and as the pirogue reached the keelboat, a number of armed soldiers got into the pirogue and started back for Clark. But then suddenly the Tetons moved away from Clark. Clark's bravery had impressed the Tetons. The Tetons thought that Clark was brave because he stood up to them. They smiled in friendship and invited the members of the expedition to their village. The explorers accepted the invitation. The Corps of Discovery had survived a dangerous situation. What they did not know was that even greater dangers and even greater victories still lay ahead. Well, there you go. I I think I did a good job reading, but the only people who really matter are the people who are listening. So if you learned something, write it down. Back to Mr. Hoops. Thank you very much there, Rattenboro. It was nice to hear you. Oh, he's already, he's gone. All right. Well, in the read aloud, you heard that Clark knew the Teton Sioux honored courage. Now, you might have heard the word honor when somebody says, Oh, my sister got on the honor roll. Well, uh, that's not the only meaning of the word honor. Say the word honored. The word, yeah, the root is honor, right? When you honor something, you respect or admire it. 
The Native Americans in the read aloud honored courage, meaning they respected and admired people with courage. For instance, I honor people who are kind. What kind of people do you honor? Well, give that some thought. And in the meantime, I hope you enjoyed today's lesson. Keep listening and keep learning.